one putting the running a team. The team's terrific to be specific as basketball supreme. There's something about that Lakers score that makes the fans want more. Station WCCO, your headquarters of the famous Minneapolis Star and Tribune columnist and the voice of WCCO in the upper Midwest. Yes, in this corner, Cedric Adams, who is known from coast to coast as Mr. Minneapolis. Thanks, Marty. Yes, Minneapolis is my hometown. Minneapolis is the heart of the upper Midwest. North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, upper Iowa, and western Wisconsin. Financially, industrially, or culturally, it's the leader and mainspring of America's vast upper Midwest. Ask a rancher in Montana, a merchant in the Dakotas. More than a million people live within 50 miles of Minneapolis and its sister city of St. Paul. The huge mining and lumbering industries of Minnesota have helped make Minnesota what it is today. But the city is most famous for its milling industry. Her preeminence in this field, which makes Minneapolis the milling capital of the world, is still to be seen in the giant grain elevators and mills right in the heart of the city. Minnesota, of course, is renowned as the land of 10,000 lakes. 16 of these beautiful cooling lakes in the land of the sky blue water lie right in Minneapolis. And it's from those lakes that one of the greatest sports organizations in the world takes its name. Yes, Minneapolis is the home of the Minneapolis Lakers of professional basketball. The Lakers are the only major league pro team in the upper Midwest. It was only four years ago that Ben Berger, Max Winter, and a group of local businessmen bought the Detroit franchise of the National Basketball League and brought big time basketball to Minneapolis. In their relatively short existence, the Lakers have brought publicity to Minneapolis unparalleled by any other sports organization in the history of our city. America's press, Magazines such as Look, Time, Life, Sports World, Sport, and the Saturday Evening Post, all national in scope and with circulations up in the hundreds of thousands, have spread the fame of the city of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Lakers. From coast to coast, the Associated Press, the United Press, the International News Service, and other news gathering services have flashed the feats of the world's greatest basketball team all over the nation. For the Minneapolis Lakers have become a wonder team in a class by itself. The Lakers have earned the stature that the Yankees rate in pro baseball. Newspapers like the New York Daily News with a circulation of more than two million. The New York Mirror, the famed New York Times, the great Chicago Herald American, the Chicago Tribune, the Philadelphia Bulletin, the Boston Record and many others are carrying the name of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Lakers to the big cities for the first time in the form of big headlines across their sports pages. Yes, as the Lakers stormed to three successive world championships, sports history was being written. Instead of becoming the favorite of Minneapolis only, the whole upper Midwest adopted them. From all over the Midwest, they poured in to see the Lakers perform. Some started calling them the greatest team ever assembled, the Paul Bunyans of basketball. Upper Midwesterners were pleased as punch for the Lakers represented the very region which gave birth to the great Paul B. Yes, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and other big league cities are now a part of Minneapolis. Old Paul B. had made his mark in the great woods of Minnesota and Wisconsin. The Lakers were making their mark in the biggest sports arenas all over the nation. Today, no one is more proud of the Lakers than the people in Minneapolis and the upper Midwest. Every day, thousands of Laker fans wait for the news of favorites as reported by the newspapers and radio and television stations of the upper Midwest. Glenn Gaff left and Bill Carlson cover the Lakers for the great Minneapolis Star and Tribune, the voice of the upper Midwest. More than 500,000 people daily and more than 600,000 on Sunday read the great Star and Tribune published by John Coles, whose success with the Star and Tribune is one of the great success stories of all time. Last year, Greyhound Bus on special chartered service brought more than 43,000 people to Minneapolis for Laker games. Greyhound agents like Melvin Gabrielson in Malacca arrange for Laker charter trips and sell tickets for all the Lakers games. 
They are your ticket office. The Greyhound agent in your town is the man to see about seeing the world champion Lakers. The Lakers fly Northwest Airlines on most of their trips. Big men like George Mikan, Vern Mickelson, Jim Pollard, and Howie Schultz rest better on a plane. Rest is a very important factor in winning basketball games, and flying Northwest helps the Lakers relax and rest. Many business firms like Minneapolis Moline arrange special nights at the Laker games for groups of their employees. There's Al Therian at the left, advertising and promotion manager for the Lakers, talking with Von Gressing and Werner Swanson, discussing arrangements for fans at Minneapolis Moline. Last year, more than 40,000 people from over 100 different firms saw the games which they attended in units like these at special prices. Get your firm to have a Laker night, or if your club needs money, call the Lakers. They have a plan by which your club can make money. Keenly appreciative of the publicity the Lakers bring to the city every year is the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce. Here, Dave McMillan, former Minnesota basketball coach, confers with Chamber President Henry Rutledge and ex-president Ed Grimes of the Chamber. They're very pleased to hear that a million fans see the Lakers play every season and that many more millions of people hear about, read about the Minneapolis team. President of the Lakers is Ben Berger. Long associated with sports promotion in the upper Midwest, Ben looks at a picture of the first Laker team of four years ago. But let's turn the pages of the Lakers' bright record. It's time for basketball. And here to tell you the story of the Lakers is Marty Glickman. The 1948 championship game. The Minneapolis Lakers had been in existence only this one season, yet here they were, shooting for the title against the Rochester Royals. A sellout crowd at the Edgerton Park Sports Arena in Rochester was pulling for the home team. But before the series was over, they were taking off their hats to the terrific invaders from the Middle West. The Lakers, wearing the white uniforms, were sparked by their one-two punch, George Mikan and Jim Pollard. And there's George putting it in. Rochester now, Risen's hook shot is missed, but Wanza scores the tap-in. Here are the Lakers, and again the pollard Mikan punch. Pollard's got the ball, and notice how cleverly Jim sucks away Mikan's man to feed the big guy for a layup. Rochester's ball, Arnie Johnson's under the hoop, and he scores for the Royals. George Mikan racked up 27 points for the Lakers in this game. Watch him there in the pivot, making two of his points right now. Laker coach Johnny Kundler was latest referred to this game as one of the greatest his team had ever played. The Lakers were brilliant every minute of the play. Rochester's ball, but thievery coming up. Mikan intercepts, and look at him dribble. Over to Schaefer, and it's two more for the Lakers. Once more, let's watch for a moment the tightness of the Minneapolis defense. They were guarding the Royals as if they were diamonds. Wanza finally cracks through with an outside set shot. But by now, the issue was no longer in doubt. Along with Mikan's high scoring, Jim Pollard made 19 points and Jack Dwan added 10 more. The Lakers coasted to victory 75 to 65. There's George Mikan doing a great job of the rebound. That was the story. By a margin of three games to one, they took home to Minneapolis their first professional basketball crown. Nineteen forty-nine. Again, the Lakers were tops. Again, they were fighting for basketball's professional championship. Only this time, instead of fighting Rochester, they were battling the Capitals of Washington, D.C. Minneapolis, wearing the dark jerseys in this game, had long become the nation's top basketball drawing card. By the time this series was over, George Mikan had set a fantastic new scoring record. For this one year, he rang up 2,001 points. That was more points than he had scored during his entire four-year college career at DePaul. But along with George, another Laker ace was wowing the crowds, and that, of course, was jumping Jim Pollard. Watch Jim steal the ball and electrify the fans as he solos in for the layup. There he goes. Fighting to stay with the Lakers, the Washington Caps put on a little razzle-dazzle of their own. Fingertip passing before Katkovic scores. But look at Minneapolis. Pollard sends a long pass to Mikan. Then over to Herm Schaefer for a pretty bank shot. The Lakers were playing with terrific team spirit, which is a hard thing to beat. 
Pollard steals again, and teammate Schaefer is all by his lonesome. The Lakers quickly roared to a 10-point lead, and Washington was never able to catch them. Here's the butte. Now watch. Pollard to Mikan to Farron and the basket. The Lakers never let up their terrific pace. Not even Mikan, who played part of the series with a fractured right wrist. The Caps ball now. That's Scaleri driving in for a basket. But the Lakers had too much power. Four games to two, they downed the Capitals. With brilliant basketball like this, they swept the triumph and their second successive world championship. Nineteen fifty. Minneapolis was once more a finalist in basketball's World Series. This year, the locale was Syracuse. The scrappy Nationals, one of the fightingest teams in professional basketball, were challenging the Lakers in the final for the world crown. The Lakers, wearing the white, had added to their club this year some outstanding new talent, including Slater Martin, Bob Harrison, and Vern Mickelson. That's Alex Hannum of Syracuse fighting for a basket under the hoop. Now the Lakers. Mickelson misses, but Jim Pollard makes it count. But hold the phone, a Syracuse fast break with Hannum steaming in to score. The crowds went crazy over this series. It was close, it was hard fought. Though both teams were under heavy pressure, it was rare that the play wasn't brilliant. The Lakers took the first game, the Nats took the second. It was the seesaw Donnie Brook between two squads that never let down. There's Mickelson faking. Pollard saves the day and scores for Minneapolis. Led by player coach Al Servi, the Nats never stopped trying. That's Servi with the ball now. Swish. But once more, the Lakers proved their competitive greatness and they forged ahead to stay there. That's rookie Slater Martin with perfect aim. Speaking of Martin, folks, watch the play coming up. First, a Syracuse shot is missed and Farron recovers. Now watch Slater on a give and go. Beautiful. Syracuse now. The Nats were in there punching all the time, but the ranks of professional basketball in which the game is played at its best has never seen a team as good as this Minneapolis powerhouse. They outfought and outshot the Nats to keep their crown. Four games to two, they bowled over Syracuse and became, for the third year in a row, the kings of professional basketball. Nineteen fifty-one. The world champion Lakers were again defending titles to the NBA's Western Division, and they met the Rochester Royals in the semifinal playoffs. The Royals wearing the white uniforms with a big hurdle the Lakers had to clear. Leading the Lakers two games to one and playing this game in their home arena, Rochester was keyed up for battle, as perhaps no other team had been before. For in their grasp was a chance to pull the upset of the season and eliminate the Lakers from the final playoffs. One big thing was riding in their favor. The mainstay of the Laker team, George Mikan, was playing with a bad ankle. There are the Lakers with the ball, handling it carefully, passing it around while they look for an opening. Bob Harrison finally sees an opening and slashes in to score. Once more, Pollard proved a terrific thief. Watch the robbery coming up. Jim stealing it away. Back come the Royals. Coleman on a set shot. In there. In the final period, the Lakers were up against the wall. They were trailing the Royals, and the clock was running out on them. Pollard lead passes Mikan, and it's good. But the Royals kept the heat on. That's Bob Davies. His shot is up and rims the basket. Mickelson rebounds and tags Jim Pollard beautifully. Two for the Lakers. But in spite of the Lakers' last ditch fight, the Royals weren't to be denied their triumph. They finally did what every team in the league had been waiting to do for four years. They beat the champions 80 to 75 and forced them out of the playoffs for the title. The Royals went on from there to beat the New York Knicks for the NBA championship. And thus it was that the Royals took the crown that the Lakers had worn for three straight years. But what of the future? Back in Minneapolis, the Lakers vice president and general manager Max Winter was not a man to rest upon past laurels. He was planning strategy for another season. And the plans were for the Lakers to regain their dominance and wind up champions once more. The office gang, Roy Christensen, Kay Lundquist, Alice Peterson, Al Therrien, and Dave McMillan make up the staunchest Laker fans on earth. Their dreams of another Laker title are not wishful thinking. Minneapolis has the talent and the spirit with which to win it. Let's go further behind the scenes and drop in for a call on some of this talent. First stop, the home of Mr. Basketball himself, George Mikan. George and Pat Mikan have taken permanent residence in Minneapolis. 
With sons Terry and Larry, the Mikens live in a beautiful new home in the suburb of Adena. George, Pat, and the children agree with Cedric Adams 100%. There's no town on earth like Minneapolis. When he was in college, George majored in law, not basketball, as a lot of people seem to think. And whenever George's heavy schedule will permit, he gets out those torts and law books. Anyone need a lawyer? Or a golf partner? George, incidentally, is very good at the game. Despite his great size, six feet, 10 inches, he's a natural athlete and excels in just about any sport you'd care to name. In baseball, for example, many major league teams wanted to sign him up as a pitcher. Mikan now owns a standard oil station in Minneapolis and hopes someday to own a chain of stations. But basketball is his number one sport. And here we have a chance to study him at a specialty, the layup shot, the most fundamental shot in the game of basketball as it's done by the game's greatest single player. George is proficient at any kind of shooting, but he is master of the pivot. There are, after all, many big men in basketball, but there is only one George Mikan. It's not only his size, but his extraordinary skill as well that makes him the biggest star in the game. The Associated Press, in its nationwide poll a year ago, named George America's greatest basketball player of this first half century. Introducing more of the Laker family, Mr. and Mrs. Jim Pollard and their children. Arlie, the voice at every Laker game, poses with the baby of the house, Jean. Cute little lady, isn't she? There's dad with son, Jack Clifford. When Jackie grows up, maybe he'll be as famous as his father, who is one of America's greatest cage stars. Jim is a native of Oakland, California, but he and Arlie and the two children, like the Mikans, have settled down as residents of Minneapolis. Off-season, Jim works at the business of selling automobiles for Mr. Oscar Borton, where a smile, personality, and sincerity like his are big assets. He plans a career in coaching or in business after his pro basketball days. Selected on the all-professional team three years, Jim was used in a special instructional film sponsored by the Kez Department of U.S. Rubber to demonstrate the one-hand set shot. Notice his perfect balance and his easy follow-through motion. Jim is known as the Kangaroo Kid because of his tremendous leap in spring. An All-American at Stanford University where he succeeded the great Hank Luisetti as a cage immortal, Jim has been with the Lakers since they began. And he's one of the big reasons why they've been on top. Recognize this big fellow? That's right, he's Vern Mickelson with his dad, who, by the way, is a Methodist minister. Vern is still a bachelor and lives in Minneapolis with his parents. Like him, the Reverend and Mrs. Mickelson are fond of singing and love to gather around the piano of an evening. At Hamlin, Vern sang in the choir, in addition to playing sensational basketball. He spends his summers working towards a master's degree in physical education. Vern was a natural for the Lakers. Though nationally famous as a college star at Hamlin, where he played under Joe Hutton, he was and is a tremendous local favorite, too. Vern's a dangerous scorer from the corner or the pivot. With Mikan and Pollard, he makes up the big three of the Laker offense. There he is on the pivot against New York. A good fake. And he scores. Now you see him use that deadly overhead shot, a big man's shot that Vern does to perfection. Here are Bob and Ruth Harrison, the proud parents of Bobby. Big Bob is a French Indian ancestry, hence his black hair and dark eyes. Off season, when he's not playing guard for the Lakers, Bob works at Superior Golf Course. Here he is with the club pro, George Lehan. A University of Michigan ace, Harrison is passionately fond of any and every sport. His high scoring in college basketball under Ozzie Cowles led Michigan to its Big Ten title in 1948. As a cage star, Bob is a terrific hustler. You'll see him in this slow motion shot cutting towards the basket on a beautiful play. His teammates call him Stonewall because of his marvelous defensive ability. Bob is also a dead-eyed dick at set shooting. There he is in the corner. So wish. Now meet Slater Martin at home in Houston, Texas. 
His is the distinction of being the smallest man on the Laker squad. He's five feet ten, but he's also one of the fastest men in the game. You see him here demonstrating the finer points of dribbling, just one of the things that Martin does superlatively well. Notice how he keeps the ball low with fingertip control. A speed merchant who started at the University of Texas, Slater was rated as the best small defensive player in the NBA. Like Bob Harrison, he's got speed to burn. Watch him now in slow motion. There he goes. Laker fans like his fire and drive and first-rate shooting from the outside. Okay, Slater, give us an example. Right on the button. Now a sensational newcomer, Lou Hitch at right, poses with Ronnie Peterson, a Robbinsdale schoolboy star. Ronnie hopes to emulate the record of Lou, who has just completed a great college career at Kansas State. A six foot eight inch youngster, Hitch is the Lakers' number two draft choice. Perhaps some of you fans remember the job he did in leading Kansas State to the NCAA Western Championship. His team lost the national crown to Kentucky and a game played at Williams Arena in Minneapolis. But no one who saw that game has forgotten the marvelous defending job he did against Kentucky's seven-foot center, Bill Spivey. A continually improving player, Hitch promises to make the Lake of Followers happy as jaybirds. Watch him block Spivey's shot. He's got the rebound, too. But now meet a veteran, Howie Schultz, the third Hamlin star to play for the Lakers. With his wife and two children, Howie lives in St. Paul. As an athlete, he's renowned in baseball, too. For four years, Howie was regular first baseman for the Brooklyn Dodgers and also played that position for the Philadelphia Phillies. But he's a major leaguer in basketball as well. He has a wide reputation for his clever playing and is an extremely keen defensive man. Off-season, he sells insurance for Bob Shea at Bankers Life. He's been called by Laker coach Johnny Kundler, one of the smallest players in pro basketball. We talked earlier about the Lakers' number two draft choice, but now meet number one. Yes, he's Whitey Skoog, the pride of the Golden Gophers. Whitey has been called the greatest player in Minnesota history. But first, let's introduce the rest of the family. With Whitey is his wife, Joyce. And that tiny future basketball star is little David. Whitey lives at 1704 Maple Street in Brainerd, and here he poses with his Brainerd High School coach, Kermit Adji. Whitey is of Norwegian ancestry. An extremely personable young man, Whitey is as popular on a basketball floor as Ludafisk on a Christmas table. He's got a lot of color and dash, and he's got a whale of a jump shot. A guy with a lot of born talent, He's made himself proficient in every department of the game. He's exceptionally accurate on free throws, extremely good on defense, and an outstanding man as a team player. A U.S. Navy veteran, Whitey broke just about every record in the University of Minnesota's basketball history. He captained the Gophers two years and was twice elected their most valuable player. Combining both athletic and scholastic proficiency, he was awarded the Big Ten Conference Medal. There you see him shooting from the outside against Indiana in a game played at Williams Arena. He hits again. Watch this jump shot. Playing with the Western College All-Stars, he was acclaimed in Madison Square Garden for his ability both as a shot and as a playmaker. We've met the players, now let's meet the coach, John Lee Kundler. There's coach with little Jimmy. Mrs. Kundler holds the baby, David. And on the right are Tommy and Jack. When Johnny's not worrying about the Lakers, he likes to relax and go fishing. Like countless other anglers, he loves to go after the bass, northerns, and crappie in those wonderful Minnesota lakes. Ticket manager Roy Christensen takes care of mail orders, too. 
Tickets for the Laker games at $2.40, $1.80, or $1.20 can be obtained five games in advance. To order by mail, just send a self-addressed stamp envelope to 106 Low Barcade. Well, that pretty well wraps up the story of this great Laker organization. Their past history and present array of talent are terrific. Cedric, how about the future? Marty, from all you've said and all that we've seen, I'd say that the Lakers are going to bring another world crown back to the upper Midwest. I know you're as proud of them as I am. They've helped make our area known coast to coast. This, after all, is a team in a million, believe me. It's established a sports record that may never be equaled again. The Lakers are your team. They've written a new legend here in the upper Midwest. They've become, indeed, the Paul Bunyans of basketball. Mackin' and Mack and Paul are two and come the running a team. The team's terrific to be specific as basketball supreme. There's something about that Laker score that makes the fans want more.